Welcome back to the Kumeyaay channel. Today we're going to continue our series of the book review of a people's history of the United States. Today we are doing chapter 15. We started on chapter nine. So we are halfway. I'm going to do a total of 14. This is number seven. Um, so we are starting here today to start to discuss the, the Roaring Twenties, but also it's going to end at, the, at World War II. So this very defining moment in the United States where it's often really misunderstood by pop culture. I, I think of immediately Flappers, the Roaring Twenties, Great Gatsby. You know, uh, history is often written from one perspective, the victor perspective, it's, and it's often myth mythology. Um, history is uh, contested ground, and it's one of those things where the narrative we are often told is not a clear one, and it often has a hidden agenda. So um, they, they call that bias. So right, what we're going to do is start out at the end of World War I, and I'm going to go in, uh, in an order of the book. I'm going to kind of just basically I have four, like four pages of notes front and back. I took a meticulous notes, so I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. So this video will, without a doubt, go over the half an hour mark. So I use this book, the teacher's edition. It just has questions and in the back. It has tools. And the reason why I'm saying that is when I reference a page number, if you're using this book, it's going to be different. This is the, the normal edition. Okay, so this book starts out, or this chapter starts out about talking about Seattle. So Seattle was ap after the war, the war ended in 1919. And what happened was there was a series of post-war rebellions throughout the world. And a lot of these rebellions were a reaction to the system itself, um, which is called capitalism. The system um, was largely, um, you know, uh, as, as Zinn talks about over and over again, it wasn't about human need. And that was the problem with capitalism. It's about corporate profit. So he talked about this. He starts out, I believe, with this in the chapter because, and he, he kind of goes through, uh, this is the core of the chapter, self-help in, in um, hold on a second before I butcher the title. Self-help in hard times, isn't that what it's called? I should know this by now. Self-help in hard times. Yeah, so when you think of the title, it's like, hmm, isn't, that's weird. Uh, why would you call the Great Depression uh, in that period of time self-help um, in hard times? So this, this title still puzzles me, actually, by the way. And it's like, it's not till you read it a couple of times and you go over and over again, you're, oh, that's what Zinn's trying to do. And largely what he's trying to do is shatter this idea of prosperity. The Roaring Twenties was a time of prosperity for a very, very few, largely the 5%. So we have the 1% now. At this moment in time, it was the 5%. Those were the folks who could enjoy the Roaring Twenties. They could buy new technology like an automobile, a refrigerator they didn't have an you know before that they had the ice box where you bought this big block of ice you know this is the beginning of, of home appliances as we know them and automation and machines and you know this is that period of prosperity for a mostly the five percent and for those 95 percent that's really what this chapter is about it's about the have-nots those who are left out of the system and also those who are left out of the new deal uh, as we will will cover eventually, the New Deal was was really um, a revolutionary, had revolutionary policies by the federal government, yet it left many people out. Uh, okay, so we, we start off with the Seattle walkout. And what happened is the general strike was this kind of new tactic where it brought an entire city to its knees. And I actually went to Seattle a couple years ago. It's an incredible um city it's actually chief seattle is the is the it's named after a chief seattle and um it's a fantastic city incredible um city to visit if you haven't just a side note um but 
So they bring this whole city down to a halt. 100,000 people walk out. And what happened was they had these generals, this idea of the general strike where you just shut everything down. Um, and this was terrifying to, to the leadership. Uh, it ended peacefully, peacefully in five days. Um, it was too challenging, but what it did was it led to raids on the Socialist Party and the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, remember them? They were now shut down. The ringleaders were jailed uh, and they were ringleaders of anarchy. Um, so this general strike literally puts the whole government out of operation. And it was a very, very scary tactic if you're looking at it from a governmental uh, policy um, policymaker, um, someone in leadership perspective. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we had um, basically strikes were not only in the United States, but in England, all over the world, Ireland, Egypt, India, Korea, Russia. So, but by the 1920s, the IWW was destroyed and the Socialist Party was falling apart. And this was to prevent mass rebellion. So as we talked about in the last chapter, you, you had the dismantling of the IWW and the Socialist Party in the last chapter. And however, this is the rise of the Communist Party. So people don't realize, but the Ameri America had a pretty, pretty solid Communist Party at one time. And, and, and correct, in fact, all over the world, which will kind of be dismantled and separated and um, torn apart like the IWW and socialist uh, parties were after World War II, which is the, the time of the Red Scare of the 1950s McCarthyism. So, you know, history repeats itself. And that's kind of how you remember uh, history is you kind of connect dots. So you can, okay, that reminds me of that, reminds me of that, reminds me of that. And that's how you get your memory for all these things. It also takes repetition but more importantly, connection. So what happened was at this point, it was one of the first times. So let me take a step back. Before, before World War I, the American economy after the end of slavery was largely dependent on cheap labor. And we covered that before in chapter nine, but it really comes to a head at this point because what the industrialists of the North reason why they wanted to get rid of uh, slave plantations um, labor in the South is they felt wage labor was just cheaper and better. You didn't have to pay for uh, your, your slave if they got sick or if they died or, or their lodging or so on and so forth. You just gave them a living, a wage, not a living wage actually. Um, and, and that was it. So, but, but more importantly, we needed these new flood of immigrants in a, in a constant, constant, constant way. Um, and especially Mexican immigrants and, and where I'm from the Southwest. So in the Southwest, and I know this, I know this pretty well, cause I, I've studied this and taught, you had, you know, Mexican American, uh, Mexican immigrants were, were the main, main uh, labor force for quite some time. And they still are by the way, um, but you have the very first, um, I guess, how would I say it, reduction and even expulsion, um, repatriation um, um, and um, exodus of immigrants at this point. So Congress would, you know, call it the dangerous, turbulent flood of immigrants. So we we had many many different anti-immigrant legislations. The very first one in California was against the Chinese, by the way. It was one of the only ones with a specific name in it. Um, so, but you had uh, all these immigrants kind of starting to get kicked out, just, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, the Chinese, Africans, um, my, hold on, my notes are kind of sloppy. Um, yes. And so you had, you know, all these, all these uh, un, unskilled um, immigrants starting to be expelled, which was kind of a, it was, the, it was the first of many to come. So, you know, over time we had many of these, like, I guess, you know, where we start kicking immigrants out or we start reacting, everyone starts getting xenophobic. This is kind of one of those, really one of the first uh, notable times for the Mexican immigrants, um, if you're interested. So one of the things that was interesting about the, the 1920s that people don't realize was it was the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan or the KKK, where 4.5 million Americans were in the Ku Klux Klan. 
Now, I've, I've heard it said a couple of times where America is not a racist country. Um, and I, it just puzzles me because as I'm reading history over and over again, you have the second, you know, the first iteration after the Civil War, the second iteration after the 1920s. And then currently in 2020, you have the rise of the alt-right and, um, you know, Proud Boys and a lot of these other, you know, white supremacist groups. So, I mean, to say that America is not a racist country to me is ahistorical. It's not paying attention. And one of the reasons why I really believe that we are a racist country, although we are moving in the right direction, um, we do have that history and it must be acknowledged, is that, you know, at this moment in time, this was 4.5 million people in 1924 were part of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, to me, that is just an incredible amount. Um, Woodrow Wilson, the president, was a part of the Ku Klux Klan. There was marches of the Ku Klux Klan going down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington at this time. And, and the members of the Ku Klux Klan were just your average, normal person. Just like if you studied uh, Germany and people who are part of the Nazi parties, they were just regular people. And so this is the part in time in history where I'm like, okay, this is definitely the legacy that America has carried with itself. And I don't think we've shed that. Although I, I believe and hope we are going in the right direction after this summer uh, with George Floyd. So the Roaring Twenties was a time of prosperity. However, it was concentrated at the top uh, where 0.01 received as much as 42% of the bottom families. 40% uh, of families who made over $20,000 um, could en enjoy um, this era of prosperity, but it was a false sense of prosperity. It hid the truth um, that uh, voting was still part of the middle and upper class uh, voter suppression was real at that moment in time, and workers were being disabled and killed by the by the hundred um, by the well hundred thousand permanent disabled, and twenty five thousand were killed in the nineteen twenties. Um, and few few po politicians spoke out against poverty, just like there are today. How many po how many presidents and, and politicians really speak about poverty? I mean, honestly, um, and and this is something that has been part of our American tradition for quite some time. We accept poverty and homelessness as if it's just normal. Um, and so this port, part in time, uh, we, were, we were also, we, we, um, we made huge tax cuts for the rich. So instead of, you know, taking money and, and redistributing it from the top down, um, we did the opposite. So we started giving the rich more and more money and then cutting the wages of the poor. So the Mellon plan is a perfect um, example of this. It was passed in 1923. Mellon was the secretary of the treasury. He was one of the richest men in America. And one thing I know about politics, I have a degree in political science, is that the, the tax codes are written by the rich for the rich um, because they're the ones that are writing them. <laughs> so uh, who wouldn't do it, right? Um, so this, this first reduction uh, uh, was, it actually used to be in the 90s um, that rich would pay 90% tax. And I think, I think we talked about that earlier. So I think that's pretty, that's like too much to be honest. But uh, I think 50% was pretty good. I don't think it should have changed. Um, but the top income bracket went from 50 to 25. And Mellon, who was a, one of the wealthiest men in the country at this time, saved uh, almost a, um, a million dollars uh, that's probably a year, $800,000 um, while poverty was growing. The lowest income just got a 1% uh, cut, 4 to 3%. And this is why a lot of you, uh, a lot of um, my students commented on that single tax uh, in, in the last chapter. But you know, this is uh, ongoing debate. Moving on. So the Communist Party grew. Uh, okay, let me uh, let's take a step back and, and read. Read my notes for a moment. Give me a second, please. Okay. So I'm gonna read a quote. So the stock market crash, so this is page 281 in my, my book, in the teacher's book. So the stock market crash of 1929, which marked the beginning of the Great Depression, came directly from wild speculation that collapsed and brought the whole economy down with it. But as John Gillibrass said in his study of that event, the great crash, 
behind that speculation was the fact that the economy was fundamentally, fundamentally unsound. He pointed to very unhealthy corporate and banking structures, an unsound foreign trade, much economic misinformation, and the bad distribution of income. The highest 5% of the population received one third of all personal income. And this is the problem. Capitalism's overriding motive is corporate profit. And it's unstable, unpredictable, and blind to human need. It's a permanent depression for many and periodic crisis for everybody. Reforms did not change this underlying fact. And the Great, Great Depression, 5,000 banks closed. Many folks were unable to get money, wages cut again and again. Industrial production went down 50%. Unemployment went from one third to one fourth of the workforce, 15 million approximately. Um, and many know about the, the Great Depression. So uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on these um, policies. The National Recovery Act, um, favor big business during the first months in office. It was enacted of a new administration. Um, then the, let's, so I wanna talk about this though. The Agricultural Adjustment Administration, the AAA, it favored large farmers and it attempted to organize agriculture. But as we'll find out, a lot of these New Deal um, re reforms were, were not, were focused at the top, just like we had in 2008. Uh, with the Great uh, Recession in 2008, the, the government bailed out banks and left everyone else hanging. Um, it did not enact the Dodd Frank Act, all the things that we were, um, you know, trying to to resolve um, that wouldn't wouldn't help uh, would help the 2008 recession to never happen again. None of those, none, almost none of those um, suggestions were were made uh, were changed um, were put into uh, reform. Anyways, I digress. So, but the New Deal's organization of the economy was aimed mainly at stabilizing the economy. This is page 285. And secondly, at giving enough help to the lower class to keep them from turning a rebellion into a real revolution. That rebellion was real when Roosevelt took office. Desperate people were not waiting for the government to help them. They were helping themselves. And this really is uh, acting directly. So this is really the core of this chapter. This is the reason why he titled it. People were helping themselves. So this is a really interesting time in history. For example, he uses uh, evictions in New York where crowds would gather and they would put their stuff on the street, their furniture, all their belongings, and then everyone would put it back. And at this point in time, uh, and unemployment councils were formed all over the country to prevent evictions, to find new homes, pay utilities and clothes, prevent discrimination with colored and foreigners, and also legal defense for those folks in union, um, basically disrupting the system with marches, hunger marches, parades, and union meetings. So by 1932, 330 self-help organizations with 330,000 members uh, were 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 active, and, but this collapsed by the 33. Um, okay. So at this point, you know, we, we um, talked, we talked about Seattle, we talked, and so we're going to talk about that more, a little bit more. And this idea of direct action, where people uh, were showing um, a powerful class consciousness. So this is really the core of Zinn's book, as we'll get to in the very last chapter of this series, that this idea of class consciousness is certainly is a very Marxian term. It's, it's, it's Marxian all the way, actually. And this is really what Zinn subscribes at the last chapter is, is that we need to understand where who, who is in the fight together and they need solidarity and to come together for reform and ultimately get the top to answer those needs. Now, this powerful class consciousness, he would say at this point in time was very strong and something to be admired. Um, so San Francisco kind of did what Seattle did and grinded to a halt where one point, um, the whole West Coast 
1934, 1.5 million workers in different industries took a strike. Communism was to blame at this worldwide conspiracy of that um, the government thought to put a um, basically a scapegoat. Those responsible refused to recognize failure in the system. For example, Ford would blame laziness. He thought, hey, there's plenty of people. Uh, he, he's quoting, uh, he's quoted, there is plenty of work to do. People would do it. That's weeks later, he laid off 75,000 workers. Very ironic. So at this point in time, you have Hoovervilles um, pop up where towns were were built on garage dumps, government pensions stop. And this is where you see, you know, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath um, starts to take place, which was about that book was particularly about farmers and the Dust Bowl. And this is the beginning of mechanization. And people started rioting and raiding, helping themselves at this point in time because they needed to help themselves. The government was leaving them behind, wasn't paying their pensions and was favoring big business with their reform, such as the AAA. Um, okay. So he uses this interesting, um, I guess, moment in time called, where it's called the Bonus Army at Washington, DC. So this is 284. This is, those were the, these were the folks that fought in World War I and they, they were promised a bonus but they wanted it early. So what they did is 20,000 people showed up at the White House to, to basically sit out in camp and they were removed um, by MacArthur, who was a famous, um, who was the famous general who would basically, um, I think he fought in Korea and then he would be the, basically the one who, to organize Japan up in the post-war effort. So the famous, uh, Douglas MacArthur, um, and many uh, two veterans were shot, and a baby and a boy were blinded. Okay, so he uses that kind of as a real um, spect spectacular event. Uh, FDR again is elected or reelected at this point. Oh, I'm sorry, he's, he's elected for the first time. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, let me see. Let me just look at my notes before I speak again. Okay, so the, the, the goal of the New Deal, according to Zinn, was this. It was two things. It was to reorganize capitalism to overcome the crisis and stabilize the system um, and head off spontaneous rebellion. Early in his administration, FDR uh, wanted to stop these general strikes and movements of self-help. So he wanted to be that middleman instead of folks basically taking action into their own hands. So at this point in time, you have a series of, it, you know, and this is, let me just talk without looking at my notes for a moment. So this, this next part actually is the core of this chapter because what, what happens is, is as these folks are, are taking um, action into their own hands, their, their self-help, the government realizes that that's an unstable model. It's unpredictable. I'll be almost done. Hold on. So they realize that model is unpredictable. Okay. So they realize that, you know, we have to take the power back. And what they did was they realized they had to become part of the unions. They had to be um, part of the process, if you will. So this idea of folks just being sporadic and taking action of their own hands was to un an unstable way. It wasn't stable to the capitalistic system, especially when you have sit downs and these ideas of shutting down entire cities for five days like they did in Seattle. Okay, so that's really the gist of what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so we had in the largest strike of all in 1934 in the South, where 325,000 textile workers um, took, um, decided to strike. But this did not come from union leadership. 
And this is really what was scaring to the government. And Roosevelt decided to finally to step in with the media, mediation board and union uh, to, to, call, to call off the strike. So we have here now the government getting involved and what they wanted to do. And here's the problem with, with the, the system itself by inquiry to Zinn is they wanted to us to funnel our grievances into the political system, into a system that would never make fundamental change. So here folks are taking action in their own hands, disrupting the system and actually making real change. So the government wants to step in. They want to control the process and funnel those grievances to the ballot box. Now that ballot box has two parties that have, you know, they agree that the establishment will never change. The fundamentals of that establishment will never change and they will never make fundamental change. Now, this is really the thesis and core of this book. And I'll probably you know, say that as much as I can because I really want you to find, find that thesis um, in all of this. It's kind of hard at, um, to be honest. So the AAA, we talked about that was Roosevelt's plan. It was to help the, the larger farmers and wanted to organize big agriculture. It did not help the poor farmers. At this point in time, you had sharecroppers making $300 a year and farm laborers making $300 a year, living in virtual, um, you know, really destitute conditions. And at this point in time, the black and white learned of their shared class consciousness. So Congress at this time uh, realized it could no longer ignore them started organizing um, unions uh, because it realized that the leadership was it, the leadership of the unions were no longer organizing these sit downs. It was the rank and file. The average Joe Schmo was doing these sit downs, which started terrifying because it was unstable to the system. So the government started being involved and then later the Supreme Court, which we'll get to that. So, okay. So you have, after 34, you have a series of strikes um, sequentially after that, 1936, 48 sit-down strikes, 1937, 477 sit-down strikes. Okay, this is the, the, this is the really at the, um, in the midst of the Great Depression. You always think of that. Folks were not eating. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have food. So people were really taking action. So the sit downs were especially dangerous to the system because they were not controlled by regular union leadership. So the Wagner Act was passed in 35 was to stabilize the system in face of labor unrest. Um, but so what happened was, although the unions were not wanted by employers, they were more controllable. They were more stabilizing to the system than the wildcat strikes, the factory occupations of the rank and file. So you have here the National Labor Board Relations, a National Labor Relations Board, excuse me, NLRB, uh, which gave unions legal status. So giving the, the stamp of approval, but they would control direct action and limit rebellion. The goal was to minimize strikes and channel the grievances into elections, just as the constitutional system channeled possible, possibly troubled energy into voting. Uh, but labor won most during its spontaneous uprisings. Let me say that again. Labor won most during its spontaneous uprisings before the unions were recognized or well organized. Francis Piven's book, Poor People's Movement, stated, their power during the Depression was not rooted in organization, but in disruption. During World War II, union mem membership exploded. However, gains from strikes started whittling down. And here's why. So the, the state started passing laws to hamper strikes, boycotts, and picketing. Supreme Court made sit-downs illegal. The New Deal reduced unemployment from 13 million to 9 million, but it was the war that put everyone to work. So the problem with the war was this, according to Zinn, was that this idea of patriotism and this is why governments like war, it sounds weird to say that, because it creates unity between all classes. So this all class unity made it harder to mobilize those who had class consciousness. 
So that's why, you know, war is kind of a panacea because it not only stimulates the economy, it unifies both sides, both, both sides of the fence, the poor and the rich. Okay. During the war, the CIO and the AFL pledged no strikes. Still unrest remained more strikes in 44 than in US history. So we're gonna cover that in the next chapter. Um, let me just finish off this final page with a couple long, uh, couple quotes. Okay, the 30s and 40s showed more clearly, this is 293. The 30s and 40s showed more clearly than before the dilemma of working people in the United States. The system responded to worker, workers' rebellions by finding new forms of control, internal control by their own organizations, as well as outside control by law and force. But along with the new control came new concessions. These concessions didn't solve basic problems. For many people, they solved nothing, but they solved enough people, they solved enough problems to create an atmosphere of progress and improvement to restore some faith in the system. So you have here the Minimum Wage Act of 38, the 40 hour work week, the banning of child labor. Uh, this, this minimum wage was pretty dang low at first, 25 cents an hour the first year, uh, but it was just enough to dull the edge of resentment. Um, housing built for a small percentage of those in need. The TVA provided jobs and cheap power, the Social Security Act, retirement benefits, unemployment insurance, match funds for mothers and dependent children. However, no health insurance, which we still have today, um, excluding farmers, uh, which we still do for our Mexican American and Mexican immigrants. Um, they excluded old people, which we still do today, and domestic workers, which we still do today. So we haven't gone very far <laughs> since uh, 100 years ago. Uh, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? But however, I do want to, I do want to, you know, I do want to talk about a bright point. Um, the WPA. So the WPA was one of these, and there's a lot of good things to talk about in, in the New Deal. I mean, Zinn is just, you know, he doesn't want to do that. I think he doesn't want to mess up his flow or his, his you know, his point. But there was a lot of good to come out of the New Deal. Um, one of those was the WPA. So this gave the federal um, they gave the Fed money to writers, artists, actors, and musicians. I myself am a musician. Um, I love art. I think without art, life wouldn't be worth living. Um, but so at this point, murals were painted on public buildings. So we have here in San Diego, if you want, if you're interested, go down to our county building. It's this, um, it's this um, deco style building of that 1920s style. And down there it has, we have, we have murals. So we, we still, throughout the whole country, you have these WPA murals that were funded by the government for beautification of the cities, as well as to give money to folks who really badly needed it. Um, so this included murals on public buildings, plays put on for working class symphonies for the first time. This was never duplicated. And in 1939, programs to subsidize the arts were eliminated. Man, I would love that to happen again. So when the New Deal was over, capitalism remained intact. The rich still controlled the nation's wealth, as well as its laws, courts, police, newspapers, churches, and colleges. Enough help had been given to enough people to make Roosevelt, Roosevelt a hero to millions. But the same system that had brought depression and crisis, the system of waste, of inequality, of concern for profit for human need, remained. At this point in time, it's important to mention the have-nots again. I talked about Mexican Americans, Mexican immigrants, who were the most the the largest um, um, uh, workforce in the Southwest were largely ignored in the New Deal, as well as blacks were largely ignored in the New Deal. They didn't because they didn't qualify for unemployment or insurance, minimum wage, social security, or farm subsidies. Um, not to mention Native Americans. Okay, so you have a lot of have nots here. Uh, Roosevelt did not push a bill against lynchings at this point in time. Again, we had the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. It, lynchings were happening very, very often, uh, most unreported. Blacks were the first hired and last fired. Um, and so we have here the end of that chapter.
And thank you for watching. I hope you are enjoying these videos as much as me. I will see you on Friday when we will continue with chapter 16. Take care, everyone, and thanks for, thanks for watching my video.